Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we filter out anything uplifting so you can enjoy suffering in its purest form. For a little perspective, how much can you remember about the last decade? Most likely you can recall a few notable events, but have otherwise forgotten everything. As years pass into distant memory, it's completely normal to forget about the suffering of the past. But important lessons are lost along the way. The 1920s was a decade full of chaos and change, and today most people know almost nothing about it. We hope to fix that with our series exploring the worst events of the decade. Today we continue by exploring the horrible happenings in 1923. Our first story is about a race massacre that was almost completely forgotten. Rosewood Massacre Rosewood is in Florida. It was settled in 1847 by both black and white settlers. Initially, it depended on the timber industry. By 1890, most of the trees had been cut down. White residents moved on to other opportunities. The black residents remained. Florida, like most of the South, enforced Jim Crow laws against the minority population. Despite this, the black residents of Rosewood flourished. Their homes were expensive and well-maintained. The local population was becoming wealthier despite attempts to suppress them. Everything went wrong on January 1st, 1923. Frances Taylor was a 22-year-old woman living with her two children. Her husband was at work most days. Early one morning, while it was still dark, neighbors heard Frances screaming. They ran to check on Frances and she was on the floor. She had bruises and appeared to have been beaten. She claimed that a black man broke into the house and started hitting her. The neighbors looked around, but didn't find anybody else. But soon enough, the facts of the case wouldn't matter. As rumors circulated, white residents began to tell each other that a black man had raped Frances and robbed her. The local sheriff was also notified that a black prisoner had recently escaped from a nearby prison. Over the next few days, a white mob began to form. On January 4th, they moved into Rosewood. Many of the black residents heard they were coming and gathered in a single house for protection. This included several children as well. Gunfire was exchanged between the white assailants and those hiding in the house. Two black people in the house were killed, but the aggressors were unable to win the conflict. Eventually, the white attackers retreated, but would return in larger numbers. A mob of angry white men soon arrived and marched through Rosewood. They began burning down all the houses. The black residents of Rosewood tried to escape, but it was difficult since nearly 300 white people were chasing them. Many were shot while fleeing from their armed pursuers. Although a white mob was trying to kill black people, other white residents tried to save them. A train conductor helped provide transportation out of Rosewood for the black people who were being assaulted. White residents in nearby towns also provided shelter. Eventually, the mob dispersed and the violence stopped, but nobody was ever held accountable. A grand jury heard statements, but did not indict anyone. Nobody is sure how many black residents were killed. Estimates range from five casualties to 27. The story isn't well known today, mostly because the residents of Rosewood refused to talk about it. An investigative reporter uncovered many of the details in 1993. Pancho Villa Assassination Pancho Villa began his career as a criminal, but eventually he would become a general during the Mexican Revolution. He was successful for many years and helped overthrow the government of Mexico, but he turned against the new government and fought them as well. In 1915, Pancho Villa's army was defeated. After this defeat, he decided to try attacking the United States. On March 9, 1916, Pancho Villa attacked the town of Columbus, New Mexico. He was defeated and the U.S. military was instructed to capture or kill him. Pancho Villa retreated into Mexico and evaded capture. In 1920, the Mexican government offered him a deal. If he would retire from politics and would stop attacking people, then Pancho Villa would be given land where he and his soldiers could settle. The deal was accepted. He lived on a ranch with his former soldiers for the next several years. 
But in 1923, he began talking about re-entering politics. On July 20th, Pancho made a trip to the nearby town of Paral. He traveled to this area frequently, usually to make withdrawals from the bank to pay his men. Normally, Pancho would travel with a large entourage. For some reason, he only took three people with him on this final trip. As Pancho and his three bodyguards traveled back to the ranch in their car, a group of men appeared in the middle of the road. They put over 40 bullets into the vehicle, killing all the occupants. There were six assassins. Two of them served a few months in jail. The rest joined the Mexican military. The United States had revenge of sorts. In 1926, a treasure hunter named Emil Holmdahl found Pancho Villa's corpse. The head was removed and was sold to a millionaire in the U.S. who liked to collect them from historic figures. Honda Point Disaster Naval vessels are frequently lost during times of war, but sometimes accidents can cause as much damage as a determined enemy. Honda Point is an area on the California coast that is just north of the Santa Barbara Channel. The channel is full of sharp rocks. It has been dangerous for sailors ever since the Spanish began arriving in the 16th century. On September 8th, 14 naval destroyers were traveling from San Francisco Bay to San Diego Bay. The vessels were all new, having been built within the past five years. These new destroyers were also equipped with new navigation equipment. For the first time, it was possible to use radio navigation beacons. Unfortunately, not everyone trusted the new technology. There was fog that day, which made it hard to see. The squadron's navigator took data from the radio beacons, but didn't believe what it told him. According to the beacons, they were off course. He decided to ignore the warnings. Normally, the vessels would make it a point to check the ocean depth to make sure they weren't in danger of running aground. But to do that, the destroyers had to slow down. The commanders didn't want to slow progress. They kept moving ahead as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the radio beacons were correct and the navigators were wrong. Seven destroyers ran into the rocks. All the vessels were destroyed. Eleven officers were court-martialed for this mistake. Four were officially admonished. The rest were cleared of wrongdoing. Berkeley Fire It is common today for fires to destroy wilderness and homes all over California, but it has happened several times in the past as well. In 1906, San Francisco suffered a devastating earthquake. In the aftermath, several residents moved to Berkeley. The population near the University of California exploded over the next several years. The neighborhoods became densely packed with houses, and many of them had roofs made of cedar. Nobody knows what caused it, but on September 17th, a fire started in the nearby grasslands. A strong, dry wind pushed northeast, allowing the fire to move into Berkeley. Firefighters tried to extinguish the flames, but couldn't. The water system was overwhelmed and fire hydrants didn't work. Furthermore, as the fire reached residential areas, the wooden roofs burst into flames. Attempts to fight the fire were mostly ineffective. Ultimately, it only stopped when the wind direction changed. In total, 584 homes were destroyed. Building codes were modified to try and make houses less flammable. It was little comfort for those that lost everything in 1923. Great Kanto Earthquake Around noon on September 1st, a powerful earthquake struck the main Japanese island of Honshu. According to eyewitnesses, the earthquake lasted between 4 and 10 minutes. The captain of a passenger ship anchored near Yokohama gave the following account. At 11.15 a.m., ship commenced to tremble and vibrate violently, and on looking towards the shore, it was seen that a terrible earthquake was taking place. Buildings were collapsing in all directions, and in a few minutes, nothing could be seen for clouds of dust. When these cleared away, fire could be seen starting in many directions, and in half an hour, the whole city was in flames. The area around Tokyo was devastated. At least 142,800 people were killed. This total included 40,000 people who went missing and were never found. 
Because the earthquake happened around lunchtime, people were cooking. This is why so many fires were started in residential areas. It didn't help that a nearby typhoon delivered strong winds on the same day as the earthquake. Many of the smaller fires gathered into firestorms where they raged unchecked through populated areas. Some of those who died were stuck in the roads when the pavement melted, their feet sank into the tarmac. The victims could only stand and watch as fires engulfed them. The earthquake also caused a significant disturbance in the ocean. Several of the smaller Japanese islands were damaged when a tsunami struck them. In the aftermath of the earthquake, rumors began to spread that Korean residents were taking advantage of the disaster. Supposedly, the Koreans were stealing and looting. This wasn't true, but it didn't stop Japanese mobs from hunting and killing Koreans. Gunno Dam Collapse Italy began using hydroelectric power very early in the 20th century. In 1916, it decided to build a dam on the Glenno Creek. The concrete foundation wasn't constructed until 1920. Soon after the foundation was created, the project ran into problems. It was discovered that contractors weren't using properly mixed cement. Thanks to this and other cost overruns, it wasn't long before funds allocated to the project were exhausted. In 1921, the dam was redesigned. Construction resumed and work continued for the next two years. By October 1923, construction was finished. Heavy rains soon filled the reservoir behind the dam. It looked like it was ready to finally start producing power. But engineers couldn't see what was happening deep inside the dam's structure. Everything went wrong at 6.30 a.m. on December 1st. A part of the dam cracked and eventually failed completely. In moments, millions of gallons of water poured out of the reservoir. It fell over 5,000 feet into the valley below. The entire valley was flooded, residents were displaced, and at least 356 people were killed. A subsequent investigation found that construction workers tried to warn management that the dam was not being built correctly. Those that complained about the shoddy workmanship were fired. Natural disasters, mob violence, assassinations, and human error were the unfortunate highlights of 1923. People were not safe from the ravages of planet Earth, and they lashed out at the less fortunate in response. Is the world a better place today, or is it just as bad as ever? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this episode, then please hit that like button for us. Consider subscribing to our channel too. There's a lot more history to cover, and we wouldn't want you to miss any of it. Also, if you're interested, we have merchandise on our website, and we have a Patreon page too. The links are in the video description. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.